Hello everyone, good to see you. It's a beautiful day here in Lagos. Not sunny, but just the way we like it. Now, did you know that too much of artificial light can have a negative effect on our health and the world around us? I'm sure you didn't think of that. We'll have more on that later on on the show. Welcome to the Environment Show, Eco Africa. I'm Neo Taigwe at the Ndubisi Kanu Park in Lagos. Now, let's see what's coming up on the show today. We'll take a look at a cleverly designed and emissions-free street sweeping device in Ghana. Find out why farmers in the Netherlands are big fans of bats. And hear about how people in the Ivory Coast are protecting baby turtles. And now we're off to Kenya. The East African country has a high domestic energy demand and in many sectors, including the tea industry, people are keen to find alternatives to fossil fuels. Kenya is Africa's leading tea producer. In Kebiko country, there are several tea processing companies that are using sustainable energy sources from the local area. Let's go have some tea. When the sun shines, the rolling landscape of Kericho County comes to life. The fields are covered in tea bushes. The special climate here makes it Kenya's most important tea growing region. Isaiah Kibet Kirui has a plantation here. He's one of hundreds of thousands of smallholder farmers who make a living growing tea. Tea is the best source of income, the main source of income. I have three boys who have uh, completed Form 4 and I didn't go for anywhere for financial support. It's only tea. After the harvest, the tea is transported to the Tebesonic Tea Factory. Here, workers divide up the leaves into batches and prepare them for the drying process. The factory uses a great deal of firewood. But because of deforestation, wood is becoming a scarce resource in the region. So the factory has begun replacing it with the briquettes made out of sugarcane residue. The briquettes are compacted. We do not require a lot of storage space. And then it's also very easy to transport them. They are not less bulky. And uh, from unit, a unit uh, weight of a briquette, we are able to generate more energy than firewood. The briquettes are made in a nearby factory. They are made of sugarcane fibers, a waste product that is left over in sugarcane production. Sugar factories often dump the residue at the roadside, where it rots and emits the greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide and methane. But in this processing plant, it is turned into a valuable resource. First, the sugarcane residue is dried and shredded. Then it's pressed into briquettes. Since they're made out of a waste product, no additional land has to be put under cultivation. Rocio Diaz Chavez is an expert for sustainable energy and has been assessing the environmental benefit of briquettes. This is in line with circular economy. So this is what we want to promote with bioenergy and bioeconomy, how you can really have a rounded cycle for the biomass. Back to the tea factory, it has been able to replace one-fifth of its firewood with briquettes. And other tea factories are following suit training their workers on how to make the switch. The hope is that one day they will be able to phase out firewood completely. If they succeed, it will help preserve the remaining woodlands and protect the habitat of numerous animals and plants. It would also benefit the tea plantations and farmers like Isaiah Kibet Kirui. When they use the briquettes, the company also uh, reduces the expenditure and they save money, and the money saved goes to the farmers. For the environment and the tea producers in Kenya, the briquettes are a sustainable solution with great potential, the potential to make Kenya tea even greener. 
In Germany, like in many other places, forest fires are a growing problem. So understanding how best to help forests recover and regenerate is more important than ever. A group of scientists decided to see what would happen if a forest destroyed by fire were left more or less to its own devices for several years. We may think we are advanced in many ways, but as is so often the case, when given the chance, Mother Nature will heal herself, even from damage caused by humans like us. Whether beech trees, maples or aspens, Jeanette Blumröder and Pierre Ibisch are always glad to see a new member of the family arrive. About 12 months ago, the two researchers began documenting changes big and small to this section of a forest ravaged by fire. That's what we we got what we hoped for. The ecosystem is starting to recover, and certain species are quickly appearing and spreading, such as these aspens. They've now brought about changes to the area that are in turn helpful for other species. In August 2018, a forest fire razed almost four square kilometers of woodland outside the town of Treuenbritzen in eastern Germany, an area larger than 500 soccer pitches. The usual practice after a forest fire is to clear the entire area and replant trees, as seen on this private land. But not in this case, thanks to a government-funded project. Here, dead trees are left standing. Local forester Dietrich Henke is testing an alternative solution, removing most of the dead pine trees and planting other species in their place. The idea is to create a mixed forest that's also home to oaks, poplars and other deciduous trees. I first wanted to see which species of tree I could use and how old they need to be before being transplanted. Carrying out tests is important to get the full picture. And that's where the forester brought in the expertise of these researchers. They're here to find out the best way for a forest to be able to regenerate and become more climate resistant, with or without human assistance. The researchers take a hands-off approach, limiting their work to observing which plants and animals settle in the habitat. It's a rare opportunity. It's now standard procedure to see to it that we repair the damage that humans have done. All too frequently, we do not give nature the time or space to do that itself and that deprives us of the chance to learn from nature. Among the things they have learned is that in addition to providing shade, deadwood also enhances the soil when it falls to the ground. It creates more humus, which gives the soil more moisture. The work Henke has carried out on his test areas is on a smaller scale than is common in conventional forest management. They're barely accessible by car, and he's erected a fence around the forest to keep larger animals at bay. He left a number of dead trees standing. Leaves have also been spread to keep the soil moist and protected during drought. We're seeing large-scale forest fires in the region, and that's going to continue, so we need to learn how to respond. And that's why researcher Jeanette Blumröder is here. She's been collecting data on soil humidity and temperature, which plants and animals settle there, and how all these factors impact on the ecosystem. Eight other research institutes are also involved in the project. The data gathered over the project's five-year time frame is being collated at her university in Eberswalde near Berlin. Our data shows that natural rejuvenation far exceeds the number of trees planted by humans. We've seen up to three times the amount of poplars naturally resettling compared to the pine or oak trees that were planted on the area. The researchers are also part of an international network. They're eager to hear about the experiences of colleagues in the US and Mediterranean countries and to learn if and how forest ecosystems can be made more robust.
Pooling our work is really important. It can help us to compare biomes or large ecological zones so that we can discuss common patterns. One thing a number of studies show is that even the remains of trees killed or damaged in severe fires help the forest ecosystem rebound, which supports the argument of letting nature be. Now, we at EcoAfrica love people who take initiatives to help protect the environment. Our next report looks at a young innovator in Ghana who has a track record for finding cost-effective solutions and sustainable ones too to problems facing his community. His latest two-wheeled brainchild, a bicycle that doubles as a little sweeper. Here's this week's Doing Your Bit. This is no ordinary bike and trailer. The sweeping bicycle collects trash as it travels the streets of Accra. Its inventor, Frank Darko, is on a mission. He wants to help clean up Ghana's capital. Actually, I'm not happy when I go out all day. When I see so many rubbish on the ground, I feel so sad. Sometimes when I see somebody from another country walking around, I feel like hiding. But I, don't want <laughs> I feel very ashamed. Uh, so. Well, this is my new invention. I, I, I believe I can, if I can do, I can do all. I can put an end, or I can do something to reduce the, the risk, uh, the risk on on the streets. He puts his sweeping bicycles together from discarded bikes and scrap metal. It takes the self-taught engineer around a month to complete one. It's just one of several inventions he's working on. Frank Darko hopes he will one day own a factory and his eco-bike idea will sweep across the nation. And how about you? If you're also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. Pollution is a problem all over the world and comes in a range of forms. Some are obvious, like plastic waste in our rivers and oceans, or the clouds of smoke billowing out of factories. But even some things we consider useful can be the source of pollution and have their own kind of impact on our well-being. We shed a little light on the issue in a new segment called Ecotech. Gazing at a sky resplendent with stars. Something many people around the world are sadly no longer able to enjoy. And that's thanks to artificial light. While there are no up-to-date figures available, in 2014, the skies over Hong Kong were already 82 times brighter than they might be naturally. We suffer sleep deprivation from too much artificial light including that emitted by smartphones. It also disrupts the orientation of nocturnal birds and insects. Our energy consumption could also be cut drastically by ensuring responsible outdoor lighting. For starters, it would help if advertising signs and building facades weren't illuminated all night long and if nighttime light were used only for the places where it's really needed. Some cities have already committed to minimizing artificial light, such as Fulda in Germany. It's among the 29 places so far to earn recognition as international dark sky communities. Cities like these make it possible to see the starlit sky again and reset the body clocks of us creatures below to their natural day and night rhythm. Darkness not only helps us get a better night's sleep, it's crucial for maintaining a balance in nature. Light pollution poses a serious threat to nocturnal species like bats. However, scientists in the Netherlands seem to have found a solution to this by creating special refuge areas for the flying mammals. In addition to keeping the bats 
safe, they also make sure their role in the local ecosystem is preserved. And there's one, and there's also one, I think there's at least five. Far away from the bright lights of Amsterdam, Dr. Camille Spolstra is after a creature that likes to operate under the cover of darkness. He is studying how lights are affecting bats. So far, his team has found that the 19 species of bat found in the Netherlands react in wildly different ways. Bats have a very strong response to light. That is actually driven by, uh, mostly by fear of predators. So if you're a bat that flies very slowly, you better hide away and don't show yourself in the light because it's, it's risky. However, if you're a bat that flies very fast and is very agile, then you don't need to be afraid that much for predators. So you're actually like, taking away valuable habitat from these slow flying species and actually giving it to, to these already common uh, agile bat species. And that's, of course, not a good thing. In terms of biodiversity, you're actually reducing biodiversity in that way. Nocturnal species are sensitive to the blue range of light, as they have evolved to use the moon to navigate. The brighter the blue, the more distracting it is. To test how species respond to other parts of the spectrum, the researchers have put up almost 200 lampposts around the country that shine a range of colours. If you take away that blue part of the spectrum and, and, and compensate by a bit more red, which you actually see here, uh, then it may actually be less intrusive for these nocturnal species. Nocturnal species may not perceive this light as intense. And that's exactly what we have observed. The world over, brightness and luminosity are growing at a rate of 2% per year. As the night gets more illuminated, Studies are linking light pollution to disrupted natural cycles as well as mental health in humans. On their orchard outside Eindhoven, farmers Annika and Carlos Fez are also members of a community fighting for darkness and its bats for reasons of their own. We try to um kill, well, you would say, the, the harmful insects in a natural way. So we use um, insects to, call, to kill other insects. And that's where also the bats come in, because bats eat lots of cockshavers. And the cockshavers, they actually eat the roots of the fruit trees, especially the apple trees. And uh, so if the bats eat lots of cockshavers, we don't have those terrible grubs in the ground eating our roots of the trees, so that's why we like bats. Bats work as natural pesticides and are an essential part of how the ecosystem of the orchard functions. This farm even has a bat hotel to make the mammals feel extra welcome. You can see over here that, it, that there are bats living in the bat hotel because the, you see what's over here underneath? Their excrements, their poo. The community around has installed special bat-friendly lights in the area to make sure the animals stay put as night falls. Around 10 p.m., the bats check out of the hotel and disperse through the farm ready for a meal and to play their role in the ecosystem. Maurice Donners is a researcher at Signify, the company that designed the lights around the orchard. He explains that lighting is more than merely installing glowing lamps. We need lighting, but we should do it in a really sustainable way. So it's obviously in energy efficiency, in, 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 in to cradle uh, type of solutions, but also in the direct effect which lighting can have. We have the, the optimal effect on, uh, uh, on the whole ecosystem and not just on, uh, on people. Yeah. 
Some districts in the Netherlands have in fact become darker as a result of such initiatives, as satellite images show, giving some of its residents and its resident bats their beloved night sky back. Like these beautiful birds, returning to Africa, we head to a beach in the southwest Côte d'Ivoire to meet another group of people who invest a lot of time and energy to help keep animals safe. These birds are having fun here. In this case, sea turtles. These marine reptiles spend most of their lives in water, but often those lives depend on them surviving a treacherous crawl to the surf after hatching underneath the sand. Just as well, they've got helpers to help them make it safely on that epic little journey. Darkness has fallen in Grand Biribi, a coastal village in Côte d'Ivoire. Every night, these men are out scouring the beach looking for sea turtles. They're wildlife conservationists. By morning, they've picked up around 30 baby turtles found in a nest. The tiny creatures will be released here near these rocks. They were born on a lovely part of the beach, but there aren't many rocks there or places to take cover, so we relocate them to the rocky spots where they can hide from predators. Turtles have many natural enemies, both on land and in water. In the sea, there are sharks and fish, and on the beach, crabs, birds and snakes all prey on them. Female sea turtles return to land to lay their eggs in the sand. After a two-month incubation, the freshly emerged hatchlings scuttle across the beach towards the sea. No more than 5% will reach maturity. The figure used to be even smaller. Of all their predators, Humans are by far the worst. Until just a few years ago, sea turtles and their eggs were hunted and eaten in Grand Biribi. I used to kill them. I was a poacher. I would sell lots of them, five or six a day. We'd hunt them at night with machetes and torchlight, often with the help of dogs. These days, when I see a turtle, it feels like my baby brother or sister, or my mother. They feel like family to me. The NGO, CEM, has been active in Grand Biribi since 2010. Sensitizing locals is one of its main challenges. Maritime police play a big part in the project. They supervise the region's waters and clamp down on anyone illegally hunting sea turtles. Maxim Gouve regularly inspects fishing vessels returning to land. There are two types of fishermen. These are Ghanaians who fish with nets, so sometimes when they are fishing, they catch turtles, but they don't do it on purpose. But there are also Liberians who use fishing lines. When they cast their lines, they can hook turtles. If the marine police don't catch them, the fishermen sell the turtles. Six maritime police patrol here. In addition to monitoring illegal fishing, they also raise awareness and distribute special nets provided by the CEM that enable turtles to escape capture. These divers have caught a sea turtle, but their intentions are strictly scientific. They are marine biologists and will return the reptile to the sea in a few hours. Sea turtles are a threatened species. The researchers attach a GPS so they'll be able to keep tabs on the turtles' feeding and migration habits. We know almost nothing about their lives in the sea. That's where they spend 99% of their time but it is difficult to research their habits. The data collected will help in planning and maintaining a conservation zone for the species. Ultimately, Côte d'Ivoire's Environment Ministry, in cooperation with the NGO, 
is working to turn the country's largest sea turtle nest in the area into a vast marine reserve. It's amazing to think that those cute but helpless little creatures will grow to weigh as much as 700 kilos. Are you active in animal conservation yourself? Write and tell us about it. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. That's all for this edition of Eco Africa. I hope you enjoyed the program. Do be sure to join us again next week. And until then, stay safe and be kind to others, whether flora or fauna. Bye. Oh